A quick update before we dive into the show. Swift News is going to take a break for a few weeks. And that's because I got some traveling coming up in May anyway. Like, I would have had to miss two weeks as it was. And I really want to get my next app out before WWDC, you know, that first week of June. And I'm working on my concurrency course. So I got a lot going on. So I'm pausing videos for a few weeks. But Swift News will be back Monday, June 2nd, the Monday right before Dub Dub starts. And then, you know, that's where the fun begins. All right. So enjoy this last episode for a few weeks. Let's get into it. First up, we have Advice to My Younger Self by Jeer Entveen. Sorry. But this is an article from someone who's been building apps for 15 plus years and just some really good advice in here. First of all, frameworks change, but good systems outlast trends. And the general vibe of this paragraph is don't chase the latest framework or the latest architecture. As he says, architectural buzzword with some combinations of MVCs and Ps or whether or not MVP is better than MVVM. In his experience, you know, all that kind of comes and goes. As long as you build your app, your logic is solid and it functions independent of the UI. You can swap out how you interact with the UI layer pretty easily. And he's worked on apps that have had to live for, you know, five to 10 years and see these trends come and go. So that's a pretty solid piece of advice. As he says, big lesson here, when you focus on making your features work independently from UI, you often gain long-term flexibility. All right, what's next, what's next? Uh, yes, reuse also comes from restraint. And I love this because I fell into this trap midway through my career. You want to make everything generic, everything reusable. And a lot of times that makes that component like more confusing than helpful. I'll read the first part of this section here. Early in my career, I thought reusable code meant making things more generic. I'd create base classes, add optional parameters, add support for every configuration that someone, big highlight here, might need. You're trying to future-proof for a future that probably will never come said it looked flexible on the surface, but in practice, it was harder to use, harder to understand, and rarely used in their full capacity. Basically, it was a piece of code that's watered down without a real purpose. What I've come to realize is that the strongest reusable components are not the ones that support everything, they're the ones that solve a few problems cleanly with a strong focus. So I echo that because like I said, I fell into this trap as well. I have created my fair share of reusable components that took in seven, eight, nine, ten 10 parameters and were completely customizable. If you find yourself in that realm, there's probably a better way to do it. Rather than having one component that can do everything, break it down into a couple smaller components that are focused, that can do one set of problems well, and maybe instead of having one thing that can do everything, you know, three or four things that can solve the problem just as well, and that will be so much easier to use. All right, we'll do one or two more and then move on. Ah, hesitant with third-party dependencies. You'll fall into this trap early in your career too. Oh, there's a library that has this cool loading spinner. Great, bring it in. And you start kind of bringing in dependencies and libraries for every little thing. And you have like 15 to 20 of them in your project. And at first, you know, it sounds great. Other developers that, you know, worked on this, contributed to the community. Awesome, I don't have to build it. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. You'll hear yourself saying that a lot. But third-party dependencies aren't free because again, if you're working on an app that has to live for many years, you'll know these third-party dependencies, most of them come and go. The developer will no longer maintain them, or maybe they don't follow the latest Swift updates. A big one back in the day was the Swift 2 to Swift 3 update. A lot of frameworks didn't make that update quickly, and they were kind of a pain in the ass to use. Now we're on this new Swift 6 concurrency. Are they going to support that? More recently, the privacy manifest. A lot of SDKs had to update to support that, and some of them were like no longer maintained and outdated. So they're called dependencies for a reason. You're depending on someone else's code. So that's not to say never use a third-party dependency. They're all bad. Just be very selective with which ones you do and make sure there's a very good use case and make sure you're confident it is going to be maintained well into the future. All right, I think we've spent enough time on this. I thought this was a great article. Go check it out. Is there one last one I wanted to cover? <laughs> Your favorite framework isn't the best framework? Nah, we'll leave it at that. I don't want to get into a war in the comments, but definitely check out this article. Moving on, in an interesting turn of events, we're going to get native Vision OS platform support for the Godot game engine. Now, what is the Godot game engine? It's a free and open source 2D and 3D cross-platform projects or even XR ideas. That means games for the Vision Pro. And a lot of indie developers are using this and there's a wide variety of games. There's a YouTube video showcasing 2024 games. You know, you got the classic old school sprite type games, but you also have, you know, 3D games. I mean, there's a whole wide variety, like first person shooters, like it, it can do a lot. And there's gonna be new XR immersive experiences. And that's what we're talking about here. This is a Apple engineer. And he says, Dear Godot community, I'm on Apple's Vision OS engineering team and we would like to contribute Vision Pro support for the Godot engine. 
And I'll scroll down a bit. The immediate goals for our contributions are to support current Godot games running natively on a window in Vision OS, so just like a 2D window up there, and to support creating immersive experiences by using a new Godot's Vision OS VR plugin. So anyway, it's a long way to say, a lot of indie games are made on this Godot gaming platform, and I'm not super up to date on my gaming platform, so <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong on this, but that's my understanding of it. And now it looks like we're gonna get some Vision Pro support, so maybe a little indie gaming on Vision OS. Next up, I wanna turn you on to a little Swift language feature, uh, measurements, it's actually a struct. So if you're dealing with measurements in your app, whether that's centimeters, over here, inches, feet, astronomical units, decimeters, decimeters, fathoms, furlongs, any kind of like measurement like that, Swift has a struct that will really help you out when working with them. It does many, many things, but not the least bit is formatting them. So if you have some crazy measurement, like 1,234.56 centimeters, you can format that to 12 meters in a wide variety of formats. So it's great for formatting, but it's also great for conversions, right? So you can have it in meters in your app, but you know, depending on if you're in the metric system or the US system, you know, meters to feet will automatically get converted. You don't gotta mess with any of that as long as you use this measurement struct. So if you weren't familiar with that and you are using these measurements in your app, I think you're gonna love this. Up next, we got a video from Paul Hudson, special effects with Swift UI text. And I gotta give him props for this intro here. I got a highlight to it. Uh, he talks about word art, right? But he gives a shout out to all the old 90s websites. And look at them, aren't they beautiful? If you were around for this day's, ah, the, the glory days of the internet. So this uh, intro really took me back, Paul. Appreciate you bringing this back to my memory here. But this video is about creating the word art. If you remember using Microsoft Word back in the day, like word art was awesome. Your book reports looked so sweet with this word art. So this video is all about using text renderer in Swift UI and iOS 18 to recreate a lot of this text here. And I'll go to some highlights here, I believe around 1230 here. You know, you can use text renderer and then he gets into metal a little bit later, but just having fun with text. Now, of course, you may not use this exact shaky word art, but learning the techniques here, you'll probably be able to create some pretty cool stuff. And then if you wanna be a wizard, I think at like 1930, this was like really, really cool. Looks like it's underwater word art. Again, that is using metal. So like I said, you're probably not gonna have this crazy word in your app, but learning these techniques and shaders and metal, uh, you'll just become a wizard with text and I'm sure you can create some really cool stuff. Next up, we got a post on the Superwall blog from Jordan Morgan, all about creating, testing, and releasing your first iOS subscription product on the App Store. Because look, it's intimidating enough as it is, like opening up Xcode, learning how to code, building your app, and just when you think you're done, like the app is built and you're like, great, let me get this thing on the app store. And you're like, now what? And that's a, it's a pretty complicated process, but that's what this article walks you through. It'll walk you through, here's the highlights, basically creating a new Apple developer account, create a new app in App Store Connect, create subscription products in App Store Connect, and you gotta get those subscriptions approved. And then how do you show those subscription products on a paywall? He's obviously he's gonna use Superwall, little branded post there. How do you test them out using TestFlight and then submit them and then get them live on the App Store and then your App Store screenshots, description. Like I said, Jordan Morgan will walk you through all of this and it's a very visual article, right? You get screenshots all along the way to help you out. Arrows pointing to exactly what button to press, really holding your hand through this really intimidating process the first time you do it because you're so nervous. This is your app officially on the app store. You're setting up people actually trying to pay you for a subscription. Like it's it's intimidating, I'm not gonna lie. The first time you ever do it, you're like, I hope I'm doing this right. So this article will help you out a ton if you find yourself in that situation. And lastly, we got a fun one for you, Flappy Swift. As you can see at the bottom, it's a WebAssembly game written in Swift. It's less than 100 kilobytes, but just press spacebar and it's basically Flappy Bird. Now, this game is really hard for me because I cannot help but read the code that are the pipes or try to figure out what the code is, right? Like var constant sum, uh, try, danger, if case, dot, success, and see, then I hit, I hit it because I can't help but read the code on the pipe, but anyway. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Swift News. Again, we're taking a break for a few weeks. I'll see you at the beginning of June, just in time for Dub Dub.